But today we are in the book of Acts, the book of Acts. And don't forget the theme that we've been doing is uh, no matter what we are facing in life, <laughs> we're all facing something, aren't we? No matter what we're facing in life, we can have victory through faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to turn your Bibles to the book of Acts, if, uh, if you're using the Bible that you grabbed on the way in, it's page uh, page, next week I won't need to do this, uh, 923, and uh, you, be our guest to take a, a, a Bible home if you need it, but we'll also have the verses up on the screen so you'll be able to see that if you don't have a Bible with you, it's no problem. The title, though, is Whatever It Takes to Share the Gospel. Whatever It Takes. Acts 16, 1 to 5. And this week was my dad's birthday. My dad turned 82. Happy birthday, Dad. He's watching right now. All right. It's his birthday. And I'm going to tell a real farm story for him. <laughs> I've never told it before here. I did tell it at Karen Chapel. A couple of the college students were there. I told it at the Karen Chapel. Uh, so I, it gave me the courage to share it here. You will remember this well, because I remember it well. It was traumatic, one of the most traumatic things I experienced on the farm. Now, if you didn't grow up on a farm, this is going to be shocking. But as we'll see, there's something just as shocking in Acts 16, 1 to 5. This, remember, as I'm telling this story, just as shocking as this story, but you just gloss over it. You read it, you gloss over it, you don't connect the dots. Not only shocking for what happened in the story, but shocking for us spiritually. So hang on, hang on. Uh, we're going to connect the dots several times and also come back to this at the end. But this spiritually, this story and then what we see in Acts 16 is something just as spiritually shocking for every one of us. Just as, in fact, it's vital that we go through this spiritually. Vital that we go through this spiritually. Something just as painful spiritually, it's vital that we go through this. Now, all right, I've set that up now. I'll connect that to our spiritual life in just a moment. I was um, on the farm. There's something that has to happen. Most people don't know it, but we, you, we end up making eunuchs of most of the male animals on the farm, all right? Uh, we fix them, all right? Uh, we, you, you have to, because if you don't, the farm would be something you couldn't survive on, because the, the male animals, I'll use cows, uh, not cows, calves. The calves, the, 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 the little calves that are boys, that we call them bulls, all right? And when they get older, if you don't fix them, they are dangerous, I mean, literally dangerous. I remember when I was a kid, uh, the the breeding bulls out in the, out in the the uh, you only leave like one or two. Uh, now they don't have any. You have artificial insemination. But anyway, it's a whole other thing. But uh, I'm going a lot further than most of you want to hear. But anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> more than what's that saying? More than I needed to know. Whatever. But uh, but anyway, we had the bulls, and they would they were dangerous out in the pasture they had their own little pasture they would like we used, i remember them chasing us and was diving under the electric fence trying to get away and they put some holes and some stone walls in the barn it was crazy they're crazy so you have to do it so but with little calves um it's not a big deal they have these little rubber band things and and they don't even know it just you clamp them on, and, and it, it withers away, and they don't even feel it. It's nothing. They don't even know what happens. They don't even know what they're missing. But anyway, uh, so that's, what's that? Yes, they do. Well, the, the little calves don't know. The little calves don't know. So, but, so that's what you do with animals. So my dad, though, I'm s saying all this, so my dad one day said, Chuck, I want you to go next door and, and I was old enough to, to drive. He goes, uh, maybe I wasn't. Well, I was driving on the road. Anyway, that's a whole other story. But anyway, I, I, he says, go pick up the cat, the little pig next door, because our neighbor had a pig farm. Not, it was a hobby farm, but he had some pigs. And, and we would, every once a year, go get, a, we call it the perpetual pig. You know, you always have a pig you're raising, and you're, it's a pet. And you've all seen Wilbur, you know, Charlotte's Web. But anyway, Wilbur, you know, there was no spider to save them. But anyway, the, uh, the, <laughs> The, the, we'd go get this pig. And so I went to get this little pig. And the pigs are the nicest animals. They really are. They make great pets and bacon. But anyway, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 he said, go get this little pig. So I go next door to get the pig. And, and the guy says, oh, you're here to get the pig? I go, yeah, I'm here to get the pig. I parked the truck. I go, he goes, oh, wait, wait, I didn't fix it yet. I said, 
okay, I just figured there's a rubber band involved, right? No big deal. So he, he comes over, he grabs one of the little pigs out of the pen, and, and he flips it onto its back. He goes, now sit on its chest, facing the back, and hold its back legs. I'm like, what? You know, I didn't, I didn't, I was a pig, I was a cow farmer, not a pig farmer. Cows and pigs don't mix. You've all seen the Westerns. Oh, no, that's sheep. That's sheep. But anyway, the, but I, so I get on this pig, and I'm holding its legs, this little tiny pig, and he's not too happy about it, but I'm hanging on tight, you know? And, and I'm, like, looking to see where, where the rubber band's going to go. But there's nowhere because they're internal in the pig. And I was like, and this guy, I'll never forget it, he takes out a sharp little knife, and he cuts open, reaches in, pulls out or wax it off, and I'm sitting on the pig holding this pig. And th you heard the term, the stuck pig? This is, must be where they got it. This pig was in, like, freaking out, screaming, you know, squealing. And I'm, like, sitting there. And then he takes iodine, and he th just, like, pours it all over the place, all over me. I've got blood. I've got iodine all over me. And, and, and the pig is squealing, and I'm going to faint, right? I'm, like, traumatized. I'm sitting there. I'm, like, oh, how could this be happening to me? How could this? I'm traumatized traumatized, right? And, and then he says, okay, take it home. And he hands the pig to me. I'm carrying it to the truck. And it's like whimpering. It's whimpering. And I, I just remember saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was so sorry. Got in the truck, drove home. I'm covered in blood and iodine, right? Driving home with it on my lap. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, so if you eat bacon or ham, you just you know what you're doing to these poor animals, right? Uh, it, you do it too. Anyway, uh, but now, wait till you see how this connects to the Bible today. Because there is a story just as traumatizing, and I bet most of you never connected the dots. But we're going to connect it today. And also, it connects to us spiritually, just as traumatic as that pig. Something must happen to us spiritually just like this and you will never forget it let's pray father i just pray that uh pray that your holy spirit would really speak to us because this is a painful sermon in a sense lord we we just kind of gloss over what you really require of us and what you want to do in our lives spiritually the surgery that you want to do on us spiritually. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. And I pray that if anybody is here or watching that has never put their faith in Jesus Christ, that they would do that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. Acts 16, verses 1 to 5. Acts, this, is, this is really a wild story. Uh, so, he came to Derby and then the Lystra, talking about Paul and Silas. Where a, uh, he came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem to the, for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. Okay? So... Paul, now if you remember the last couple of weeks, Paul is carrying a letter to all the new churches, the churches, the Gentile churches from the council in Jerusalem. Remember the, the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem had, had made a decision and the letter said that not to listen to the Christian Pharisees. Remember the Pharisees were demanding something. They said that you are, you are saved by faith, not works. Okay, remember? You're saved by faith, not works. Don't listen to these Christian Pharisees. They're spreading some false teaching. Don't listen. You don't need, the letter says you don't need to follow the Jewish law or be circumcised. Okay? And circumcision, in case there's anybody who's so naive, uh, circumcision is, uh, the word circumcised means to Cut literally means to cut around, okay? And it's when, when you cut the male foreskin off, usually it's when a baby, if, if it happens, it's almost always when you're a baby, you're born, all right? The Jews were how, how many days old? Eight. 
eight days old. They had to be circumcised. Uh, we still do it uh, traditionally in the U.S. with most people, and, and it's, it's very, uh, very, very painful. All right, we'll get back to that in just a few minutes, okay? So you don't need to, though. The, Jew, the Jews at eight days old had to be circumcised, but he's stressing to the Gentiles who weren't circumcised, you don't need to be circumcised in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You don't need to do this for salvation, okay? So he's carrying this letter. He's reading this letter in all the churches. He's stressing that they don't have to follow the whole law or be circumcised. They just have to have faith in Jesus. And then he gave them some other things to do, sex, not be sexually immoral, you know, some, some basic holiness things that he gave them to do, okay? And then he recruits Timothy. Here we just saw he recruited Timothy to join his mission team. And then he tells Timothy, I want you to get circumcised. What? And you can imagine what Timothy said. What about the letter you just read to the church? You know, what's going on here? No wonder John Mark quit your team. You know, you're crazy. Yeah. Right. Right. He, he's, took it, he's taking John Mark's place. Right. And you're crazy. What in the world is Paul doing here? This doesn't make any sense, does it? He just fought against legalism. And, and ruled in favor of grace. He stressed legalism for grace, and now he turns around and he seems to be enforcing the very thing he was against, doesn't it? Did you ever think about that? But there's a very important difference now. Now that it's been clear, cleared and clear to all that no one has to be circumcised, no one has to follow the law or be circumcised, now that it's clear that circumcision has nothing to do with salvation and following the law has nothing to do with salvation, now that that's been established, Paul feels free to ask Timothy to voluntarily get circumcised. To voluntarily get circumcised. You see the difference? It's not a requirement for salvation. He's already been saved. It's clear it's not salvation. He says, I want you to do it voluntarily for the sake of the gospel, to remove any potential roadblocks to sharing the gospel as, as we go on this mission trip, because that's what it would have been a potential roadblock for sharing that. It's, do you understand what I'm saying? It's what 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23 is all about when Paul says, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. You hear that? I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. Verse 23, why? I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. I become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. It's for the gospel. He did this for the sake of the gospel. Paul still carried this letter around. He had it everywhere. Carried it in his back pocket. Every church, we are saved by faith. But he didn't want anything to block the sharing of the gospel, which is why he asked Timothy to get circumcised. And most of you read that all these years. You've read over that, and you really missed what Timothy went through. It was brutal. It was brutal. It was horrible painful. Once again, usually eight days old, we don't remember. Babies don't remember it, right? Boys don't remember it. But if you wait till you're an adult, it is brutal. It's as bad as what happened to that pig, you know? It's as bad as what happened. A, a, a male adult that is circumcised is incapacitated for a days and days, even a whole week, can't even move. It's the... It, there's so many stories in the Bible about it. Just, you know, you know Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Jacob's sons, right? The 12 sons, they played the dirty trick on that one city who raped their sister, right? Who says the Bible's boring? And so they had them all get circumcised, and he went and three or four guys went and butchered the whole city, wiped them all out, all right? Uh, that, that's how incapacitated the, and how brutal this is. You, he, this was really, really hard for Timothy to do. Think of the pig. That's what Timothy went through. And I call this the gospel test. Why did he do it? The gospel test. 
Is anything in our life hindering the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is there anything in our life that needs to be cut out of our life for the sake of our witness? Anything for the sake of our witness. Something I was thinking, I was trying to think, what, like, what's an example of this? And I thought of the masks, wearing the masks. And, uh, you know, I hate masks. I can't breathe. I'm OCD, and I can't breathe with them, right? I hate them. And we always knew the science was sketchy. But for a time, we wore them here. Everybody wore them here. Why did we wear them in the church? And it's still okay. If you want to wear a mask here, you are welcome to do it. Nobody judges. Nobody looks down on you. If you feel more comfortable with that, wear it. Nobody will ever judge anybody for wearing a mask here. All right? But, but why did we all wear them for, for, a, for a time here? Why? And, and it wasn't because of Dr. Fauci. That's not why we wore them. We wore them so that people would feel comfortable coming no matter no everybody would feel comfortable coming at the height of the pandemic we wore them so people would feel comfortable and 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 that that's why because we wanted everyone to feel comfortable to come and hear the word of god and hear the gospel and still if you feel more comfortable please wear it we want everybody to feel comfortable we want you to feel welcome we want you to feel like you can come and hear the gospel here and why did we do that that was the gospel test will it help share the gospel of jesus christ and that's just one example i was just trying to think of something that we all would remember we've all lived this right uh you know we we all know you know what i'm talking about but that's the gospel test the gospel test. Will we will, will it help share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Will it help share the gospel of Jesus Christ? This same principle applies to the body of Christ. Same principle applies to the body of Christ. Romans 14, 19 to 21 says this. Let us there make, therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. And when they're talking about the, the uh, meat, that was the meat sacrificed to the idols, okay? Uh, we talked about that with a letter, but also with drinking wine, just drinking wine. What And, and this... Drinking is, is a really, uh, I, well, first of all, I call this the brother-sister test. Just like we had the gospel test, this is the brother-sister test. Is anything, is there anything in my life that could cause my brother or sister in Christ to stumble, to fall, to struggle spiritually? And a great example, I'm trying to think of a good example of this one, and I thought of drinking, alcohol, all right, drinking, because that's in the verse, too, and it was an easy one. Um, this is a this is a, a tricky one because uh, I encourage Christians to be really careful if they have feel freedom to drink alcohol. They are very careful who they drink around. Be very very careful because you might be drinking around someone who thinks it's wrong to drink. A lot of a lot of Christians aren't comfortable drinking. All right, and so that that may cause uh, you might upset them and hurt their faith by doing that. I've seen it happen. Or you might be able to handle drinking, but you might be around someone who can't handle the alcohol. You, they can't handle the alcohol. There are lots of recovering alcoholics in our church. I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but you know, yeah, because it's called an, you know, it's Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Although people share their stories all the time here, it's not a big deal. But anyway, the, but the point is, there are lots of people that struggle with alcohol that you don't even know. And, and it's really important that you're really, really careful. There's lots here and there's lots everywhere. We live in a, an alcoholic nation, you know? I mean, let's face it, right? And, and there's lots of people everywhere. And so we, there was a home fellowship one time. They did a retreat. They went away, and they went to somebody's house for the retreat. And I don't even, I don't, if it, you were involved, don't feel bad. I have no idea. I don't even remember who was involved or whose house or anything. So everybody just relax, relax. All right, you're not in the hot seat. But there was alcohol served at the retreat. And... Uh, you know, the, the, the weekend away, the home fellowship retreat, there's alcohol served, and someone came back to me and said, who was a recovering alcoholic, who was at that, that retreat, and they were so offended. They were tempted. And I had to go to that group and say, hey, no, 
you got to you got to no and we were, I remember we had a baseball game and we had a baseball game and there was someone at oh, we used to go to the the game and the people who were involved aren't here anymore but uh, there was a baseball game and someone in our group was ordering alcohol at the baseball game and there was lots of recovering people all around him and I knew that so we we talked to him Remember Brian? Where's Brian? I gave Brian the dirty job. He had to say something. Remember that? And the guy gave you pushback. Was really mad. How dare you? And this guy should know better. He's a ma- we thought he was a mature Christian. And, uh, and he's not here anymore, so it's not a problem. But anyway, uh, mostly over this. But anyway, the, but I, I, we finally had to just make it a blanket. Listen, anything church-related, let's leave alcohol out of it. We don't need it. We don't need it. Is it wrong to have a, a, a glass of wine at dinner with your wife or something? No, it's not a sin. It's not wrong. But as a church, church events, church people, I just encourage people, don't drink around other people at church because there's lots of people that, are, that could struggle or you could cause offense or we don't need it, right? We don't need it. We have the Holy Spirit, you know? Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. We can have fun without it. Uh, and, and so just be careful. If you have the freedom to drink, just be really careful because that's what we call the brother test. And you never know who you're impacting. One of my kids, who's not here, I can say it, saw someone from our church drinking out at a restaurant. And, and you know, and I was really dealing with this, this child. And now they're grown up and, and uh, now they know better. But anyway, I was like, I was like really dealing with it. And, and I was like, yeah, I go, why can't I drink? I saw so and so from church drinking at blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, first of all, you're not 21, first of all. So it's against the law for you. But, but uh, number two, uh, you know, you're right. They probably shouldn't be. So I said, I said, they probably should be more careful, you know, because think about that. We think, oh, it's no big deal. But you don't know who you affect. You just don't know. So that's just one example. There's, you can think of lots and lots of examples in our life, right? That's just one example of the brother test. So we have the gospel test and the brother test. And those I'm just giving some easy examples to share, okay? Uh, so back to circumcision. I want to finish, drive this home now to all of us. I want to finish with another key for Christian. Circumcision was given to who first? To whom? Jews, but specifically, who, who was the first one? Abraham, right? Abram, Abraham, all right? First one to get it back in Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, verse 1, when Abram, he was Abram at the time, was 99 years old, (laughs) the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make a covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers Verse 9, then God said said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you must be circumcised. He's 99. Circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you for the generations to come. Every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Okay, and then verses 23, on that very day Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money every male in his household and circumcised them as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that very day. So Abraham gets it. And then later on, Moses, the law, when they left Egypt, uh, they, it's Leviticus 12.3. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised, is given in the law to all the, the Jews. Okay, uh, Why did God pick circumcision? Why not a tattoo? <laughs> You know what I mean? Why not something a little easier, right? Circumcision, I mean, he picked the most painful thing imaginable. Think the pig. The most painful thing imaginable. Why did he pick that? 
because it was to be a sign of commitment, a sign of commitment to Jehovah and a reminder of the covenant, the covenant that we will love God and obey his law. It was to be that. And, it's all, and it also set them apart from the pagan nations. This was really different. Nobody else was doing this, you know. This was set them apart, and it was a sign of their holiness. It's a sign of holiness. Just as they cut away their foreskin, the flesh, just as they cut away the flesh, it was a commitment to cut away sinful flesh. It was a type. It was a picture. It was a commitment to cut away not just the flesh, but the sinful flesh. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 says this, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. It was a picture, the physical picture it was of, a, of a spiritual reality. That was what it was all about. And it was also a type, a spiritual type, a spiritual picture. A type is a spiritual picture of what Jesus Christ would do for every one of us. Colossians, in Colossians 2.11, it says, In him... If you're a Christian, this is to us, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Our old self was cut off. It was, it was, it was cut away. See, we are all called to be circumcised, not Physically, that's optional for a boy, you know, when you're a baby, right? Uh, but that's optional for anybody. But spiritually, we are all called to be spiritually circumcised. And it hurts. Being spiritually circumcised is painful. Can I get an amen on that one? Yeah. Ho listen, holiness hurts. It hurts as God cuts away our sinful flesh, as the Holy Spirit surgically removes the sin and strongholds in our life. It hurts. The Holy Spirit surgically removes. It's like a cancer. Those who have struggled with cancer know what I'm talking about. You have the cancer cut out, and then it's chemo. It's painful to go through that process. It hurts. It hurts. What do we need to let God cut out of our life, no matter how painful it is? No matter how painful. And you know, the, our, our favorite verse, and I read this a lot here at, at the church, our favorite verse, uh, church verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 11, gives a list of potentials that need to be cut out of our life, of what we were, what God has to sanctify us from. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. We all were, weren't we? We could add to that list, couldn't we? That's what we were, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what we were, but we were washed, sanctified, and justified. I want to focus on that sanctified here because that's what circumcision is. Sanctified means to be set apart. It means to be holy like God, and that's what circumcision is a picture of. We're to, that's what's to happen to us spiritually. We're to be sanctified, circumcised size set apart from God and that's what that's what we're called to do and then he goes on in Acts first uh, Corinthians 6 to give a specific example of something that needs to be cut out he takes something right from this very list he picks sexual immorality he says in first uh, first Corinthians 6 18 flee from sexual immorality all other sins a man commits are outside his body but he who sins sexually sins against his own 
body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he comes into you who is in you, whom you receive from God. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And he gives that example of how important it is. What do we need to cut out? I'll just use this one. I'm just using one application. It could be anything in our life, but this is an easy one, and it's right, right there in the passage. What do we need to cut out to be sexually pure? It could be a person. It could be a place. It could be a thing. No matter how painful it is, we might have to cut somebody or something out of our life. We might have to break up with someone. We might have to break off with someone. We might have to get rid of our phone. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> you can do it. You can still breathe, I promise you. I grew up without a phone. Lots of us grew up without a phone. We had that one that was had a cord into the wall, and you remember you had to turn it, you know? All right? What's that? Primitive times. Primitive times. We ride our dinosaur and dial our phone, and right? <laughs> or it could be our computer. At the very least, we should have blocks set up on our phone and our kids' phones, for heaven's sakes. Or, or have accountability with our computer, covenant eyes, or something. We should, at the very least. But, but even if we, that doesn't work, then we got to get rid of it. No matter how painful it is. How painful, whatever in our life we have to get rid of to be pure, we've got to do it. And, it. and it could really hurt. It's painful. Think of the pig. Pain, but that's what we need to go through to be pure. You know, uh, that, that pig, that was horrible what that pig went through. But you know what? That pig never struggled with sexual temptation again. <laughs> never did. What do we need to cut out of our life? <laughs> Never again. That's just one application. We must cut out everything in our life, all the sins and all the strongholds that we're, the Holy Spirit's convicting us of. We have to cut out all the triggers in our life, all the triggers. We've got to cut them out. And we have to get our healing. We have to get our accountability. We have accountability groups. We have purity, purity, men's purity group. We have women's group. We have all kinds of groups. We need accountability. Just find one other Christian to hold you accountable. We need to get the counseling. It might be so strong that you need to get some real Christian counseling, you know, you know, from someone in the body of Christ or a Christian counselor. But, but we, we get our healing, get our freedom, get our circumcision. How is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? How is he speaking to us? What do we need to surrender to God's surgical knife? What do we need to say, God, circumcise me. Sanctify me. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. What do we need to cut out of our life that is hindering our witness? Whatever it takes, I want to share Jesus. I not only want to be like Jesus, I want to share Jesus. Does this pass the gospel test in my life? Does it pass the brother test in my life? Whatever it is. And maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian yet. You still need to be circumcised. You've never been spiritually circumcised. You're not a Christian yet because you need to take that first step. Back to Colossians 2 verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. I read that one already. But when? Look what happens. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all us all our sins. Wow. It's all connected. Our salvation, our spiritual circumcision. And when did that happen? When did, were we circumcised? 
when we put our faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Believing in him, that is the same exact word for faith in the other verse. It's the same exact word. It means the same thing. It doesn't mean believe in your head. It means to believe in your heart. It means to put your faith and trust and total dependence in Jesus Christ. His death on the cross to, to take, pay for our sin, his resurrection from the dead to give us a brand new life. We get a brand new life too. Do it. We get a brand new life in Jesus Christ. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus? Let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? You might be here today. You might be watching, listening to this, and you've never put your faith in Jesus. You are still uncircumcised. You still have all the sin and strongholds and garbage and shame. You're still living like a, a, a pig. We all were there. We all were there. But we don't have to stay in the pig pen. We can be washed, sanctified, justified through Jesus Christ, our faith in Jesus Christ. You can have that freedom right this moment. You can walk away from that pig pen right now. You can have a new life in Jesus Christ right now by putting your faith in him. The simple prayer of faith. God, I repent of everything in my life that goes against your word and your will and your purpose for me. I repent of the sin that separates me from a relationship with you, God. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. I repent. Please forgive me. I'm walking away from that pig pen. I'm asking you to wash me, forgive me. Because I'm putting my faith in Jesus. His death on the cross, his blood that he shed washes me. I put my faith in Jesus. I give my life to you, God. I want the new life that I can have by the power of the Holy Spirit. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, or if you do pray that prayer of faith, then something amazing has happened. You have become a new creation in Jesus Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. You're a brand new person in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is now living inside of you. You now belong to Jesus. You will spend every day and then eternity with Jesus Christ, a brand new life now and forever with him. I want to encourage you to tell somebody if you've prayed that prayer of faith, you've given your life to Jesus. Tell me on the way out. Fill out the card, stick it in the box. Text me, call me, email. Tell, maybe you're here with a family member or a friend or you, have a, 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 you know someone who's a Christian, maybe at work or at school. Tell somebody so that we can be excited for you and help you grow in your new life. In Jesus, you're a baby Christian now. We're going to help you grow. For those of us who are already Christians, what is the Holy Spirit convicting us of? What in our life do we need to cut out 
for the sake of the gospel. It could be something good, nothing bad. It could just be something good, but, it's, but it needs to go so that we could share the gospel more effectively. What in our life needs to be cut out because God wants it cut out? so that we could become more like Jesus, a sin or a stronghold. And the Holy Spirit is convicting, and maybe we've been hanging on to this sinful flesh, not letting this be cut out for years and years, but today the Holy Spirit is convicting you. Will you commit and say, God, whatever it takes, whoever I have to talk to, Whatever it takes, I want to cut this out of my life. I want you to circumcise this from my life. I want to be holy like Jesus. Father, we can all think of a lot of things right now. I pray that your Holy Spirit wouldn't give us a moment's rest that you would hound us through your Holy Spirit's conviction until we're set free, until we're washed, until we're out of our pig pens, until we're washed, until it, the garbage is cut away, until we really know the full life that Jesus wants us to live, the joy and the peace and the power. I pray that you would revive us and accomplish this in Jesus' name. Amen. wonderful day ahead and have a great week as well. You're dismissed.